Hi, welcome to my show, uh, Friday PM. My name is Luigi Scarcelli. Uh, my guest tonight uh, has got a very special memoir that I uh, enjoyed reading quite a bit called The Ghosts of Walter Crockett. Uh, he's a state representative. He's also president of Eli Soda. Uh, his name is Ed Crockett, and we're going to sit down and talk to him a little bit about his book. So hope you stick with us. Thanks. You grew up in Munjoy Hill in the 1960s, uh, 61, correct? Yeah, I was born in 1961 and grew up on Kellogg Street, okay. right at the uh, tip of Munjoy Hill. Okay, okay. And what was the neighborhood like in those days? <clears throat> well, it was quite different from what it is today. Okay. And, and the primary differences that I noticed more than anything is there were really no cars on the road. Um, a lot of the families that lived around Kellogg Street, like mine, did not have a car. So, and if the families did have a car, it was parked in their one lane driveway. So the streets were wide open. And frankly, the streets were our playground. Because that's where we played, whether it was football or actually hit tennis against the buildings, all these different things. And, and of course, in the early 60s, that was the end of the baby boomers. So there was a ton of kids, right? Uh, you know, living up on the hill, and of course back then it was it was a low income neighborhood. Um, pretty much everybody there was, uh, most were often single parent households, um, and a lot of kids. Uh, like I was the youngest of eight, and all around us there were, you know, multiple uh, kids in every, in every house, and and the other thing that really struck me was. <clears throat> um, today versus then is I wax nostalgic and I drive up on the hill all the time because yep. I still live in Portland and you don't see any kids driving around. Right. And one of the things that struck me the most was when I was growing up on the hill there were six elementary junior high school schools on Munjoy Hill. On Munjoy Hill. Uh, today there is one and it's an elementary school. Um, so the kids are gone, and now you can't find a parking spot. Right, exactly. Your, your life story, I, I mean, what I found really interesting is it really had a dramatic change at a very early age for you. I mean, it was the age of two when your father left home, and it was a very difficult time for him, as well as your mother and, and you and your siblings. Uh, and that's really the trajectory of the book. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit about that time and, and really kind of what happened? Yeah. Um, well, my dad was uh, a Korean War veteran. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> after coming home from the war, um, that's when he met my mom. And now my mom already had five children from a previous marriage. And But they, they, they struck up a relationship and in 1958 uh, got married. Uh, they had my brother Walter uh, in 59, my sister Carolyn in 60, and then I came along in 1961. Now, unfortunately for my dad, he was, he was already an alcoholic. Um, you know, we, we, would have, we would have considered him an alcoholic today when he was 15 years old. Right. Because he was, he was running around in bars at 15. And interesting that they, they called it, he had his own cut at most of the bars, which Today is a credit card. Right. right. Um, Tab. So he, uh, you know, he was, you know, drinking heavily already. Um, and then I believe the added responsibility of three kids on top of five others um, probably was, was too much for him. And so the drinking just got out of control to the point where um, in 1963, when I was two, uh, my mom had to had to kick him out, right. and and the biggest reason that that happened because that was a very hard thing to do, especially in those days. Right. Um, and but uh, my mom had some health problems of her own, which limited her you know employment opportunities, and with my dad living with us, uh, we would not have uh, qualified for state support, right. and. Um, so that was it. He, he left. Um, sadly, Dilly didn't have anywhere to go and spent the next 17 years on the streets of Portland. Yeah, he was a homeless person in Portland for, you'd said that in the book, I mean, almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. And 
Do you feel like that was, I mean, that's, as you're saying, in those days, I guess there really wasn't a lot of other opportunities. And, you know, and he also was afflicted with alcohol addiction. And, yes. Yeah. No, there really wasn't. The only, um, we, we called it a flop house back in the day, right, right. Uh, was on India Street. Okay. Uh, it was called the 24-Hour Club, which is the milestone recovery uh, center today. Um, and it was obviously, it was a, a, you know, it might have held 20 to 30 uh, men, uh, primarily back in those days. And it was, you know, first come, first serve. And there were a lot more than 30 people out on the streets. Exactly. So what, you know, most of them ended up sleeping in the park or finding cover, you know, uh, behind buildings and getting out of the cold and the wind. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the jail was actually a, a haven back in the day because if there was room in the jail, right, right. Uh, the, the police would, would let them sleep it off in a cell and, um, they, they, and they walked out the next morning. Uh, you know, times have changed. That's probably not practical today. Right, right. But um, those are all the different things that was going on back in the 60s and 70s. But as you were growing up, I, you know, you had, to, uh, you know, it was a lot of struggle with what I read about was a lot of the struggle of, of basically being in poverty. I mean, the poor kids thought you were poor, right? That's, you were, yes. you were, right. and yeah. you struggling to have coats that w didn't look like the coats that were from the government issued coats. Right. I mean, it was it was a lot of working your way through a lot of that, and that's that's very difficult. There's probably a lot of shame involved, and just a yeah. very difficult thing about being in that circumstance. And and compounded was that you know your dad was a reminder of that often. And yeah. what I called from the book that was really difficult was that time that you talked about when you were in grade school. I think you were going to school at Chevrolet at the time. I was a freshman at Chevrolet. Freshman at Chevrolet, yeah. waiting for the bus. It was on Munjoy Hill, Washington Avenue area. It was actually the corner of Lincoln Park. Corner of Lincoln Park. And your dad came upon you and your friends panhandling. Mm -hmm. And so that's the horror of it that, oh my God, and your friends knew the situation. Some did. Some yeah, did. Some but did. the compounding part that was the most horrific part was that he did not recognize you and he's panhandling from his own son and didn't even recognize you because probably because he was drunk or things like that. I mean, and you said you ran miles. Yeah. So not that I've already explained a lot of it to you, but can you tell me a little bit about how that felt? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll um, extend a little bit of that story and I won't go there. There are, there are a number of situations where, you know, the two forces met, mm -hmm. you know, during, during my youth. Um, that was one. I, I won't, won't get into all of them because we want people to right, actually read, read, right, read, the, exactly. read the book and buy the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was a, I was a freshman uh, going to Ferris, and this was interesting I, too for the time. You know, kids that went to the um, uh, either Ferris or Macaulay that lived in town picked up the bus at Lincoln Park. Okay. Now that, that sounds pretty reasonable on the on the face of it. But Lincoln Park at that time was where all of the, you know, the, the bums and the transients and the homeless basically lived. Um, so it was quite common that as we waited for the bus, there would be, you know, um, guys on the benches, you know, passed out, you know, reeking of alcohol, um, often panhandling. Uh, I will give my father credit if he had his senses in that moment and he recognized who we were, he went the other way. Right. This particular morning, uh, he was he was too far gone. Right. Um, and you know, was was needing that next drink and panhandling was the way. Um, so he was going through the kids and then landed in in the group of kids that I was standing with. And um, uh, pretty sadly, looked me right in the eye and asked me for for change. Yeah. And I panicked. Right. Um, and I just ran right. away. And um, never never went back to Lincoln Park to take the bus again. Right. Yeah. It's... Before we get too much further in depth about this, and we don't want to 
dredge up too many things. Let's take a look at a few photos from your book, and then it gives us more context about it, growing up in those days. Uh, and then we'll come back on the other side, and we'll talk a little more about your relationship with your dad as you got a little older and, and how that evolved. That'd be great. Okay, thanks. We'll be right back. We're back. Uh, we're talking to Ed Crockett about his book, The Ghost of Walter Crockett. We just saw some photos, uh, got kind of an understanding of, of that time. Uh, I kind of wanted to also touch a little bit on, as you got older, you went to college, you'd worked hard, you got into, uh, you were at Orono undergraduate, Boston College for your graduate studies. Yes. Uh, around that time, and I think it was your undergraduate studies, is when you and your father had that second chapter. You were able to reconcile a little bit with him. You talk a, a bit in the book about the story where he, he finds you, he knows where you're at school, he's working as a custodian up in the Bangor area, and he wants to talk to you, and before me telling too much about it, can you tell me about that, that chapter where things yes. restarted a little bit? Yeah, the, the, the real miracle is that after 17 years, you know, um, on the streets. Uh, he was drying out uh, for what proved to be the final time at Togus. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> while there, uh, he met this um, intern. Uh, they took a shine to each other. And um, about a year later, they were married. Mm -hmm. um, all of this was news to me. Wow. You know, I, I wasn't aware of any of this because I hadn't actually seen my father since that incident in Lincoln Park. Right, right. When I was 14. So fast forward to my junior year in college, and I was in uh, my fraternity uh, house, and it was it was April of uh, 1982, and um, my father showed up at my fraternity house, and um, uh, he had been. Uh, two years into sobriety. Um, his wife was getting her master's degree in psychology at the University of Maine. Yeah. So that's what brought them to Bangor. To Bangor. In area, and they actually had settled in an apartment in Orono. In Orono. <clears throat> so, and, so he'd been there since September. And um, he finally worked up the, you know, the, the courage to try to re-enter. And... Um, and that was the start of a 30-year second act and a relationship with his children. And, you know, that was, um, that was, you know, unimaginable. You know, certainly for me at the time, it was also an incredible blessing. Um, <clears throat> I was wise enough not to totally push him away. Uh, I did not open him with, uh, welcome him with open arms initially. Um, but over time, um, we were able to, um, you know, get to know each other and eventually, um, you know, love each other. It's kind of like, uh, better late than never in a sense, right? It, was, it took, it took some extra years, uh, I mean, you know, that probably difficult. It, it, it took, it took more time and that was probably more about me because um, my mom is, is my hero. Right. Um, you know, she sacrificed everything, mm -hmm. you know, for us. 
And she was always going to be first. Right, right. So um, <clears throat> that was a good built-in excuse, if you will, to keep, to keep my dad at arm's length. Um, at least until I was sure that, you know, this sobriety thing was for real. Now, what, what are your thoughts as a father uh, learning all these experiences? I mean, does that change who, you know, who you are as a father to your, your children? For sure. I mean, I, I, I hope this doesn't sound um, corny, but having the experience of, you know, a terrible parent mm. uh, turning it around and, and, and redeeming themselves um, certainly softened my heart right. and, and how I looked at things. It, Luigi really taught me, probably the, the biggest thing I got out of it was it taught me and helped me understand what forgiveness is all about because I hated the guy. Right. And I had good reasons. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. I had good reasons. And, uh, but slowly but surely, um, you know, by accepting, you know, the disease and, and working hard to have a relationship um, made me a better guy. Mm -hmm. And as a result... I think hopefully a better, a better parent myself, yeah, parent. Uh, because I'm much more forgiving. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably uh, maybe sometimes too understanding. Right, right. Um, but you know, we certainly talk about it freely um, because uh, alcohol is a beast, and um, if you if you can't be honest and and uh, direct about it. Um, you're probably just the one kidding yourself. Exactly. I did want to mention you are going to be doing a book signing on December 9th, uh, which is a Thursday. At the, it's a public book signing at the Shipyard Tasting Room. Tasting Room down yep. on Newberry Street. Okay. In, down in the Old Port. Yep. Uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. Okay. And um, never done one of these before. Yeah. So uh, very excited. Uh, right. Hopefully. Uh, Hopefully a lot of people can, can get out there and um, be happy to sign any and all books. Well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Well, thank thank you for lot, having me. And yeah. So. I want to thank my guest, Ed Crockett, his book, uh, Ghost of Walter Crockett. It's great. Definitely pick it up. Uh, my next guests are a band from Biddeford uh, called Side Chick Syndicate. They're a lot of fun. They're a good, funky band. Uh, we're going to hear a song from them, and then we're going to talk to them on the back end. So thanks a lot. Stick with us. Take care. Society, but there's no society anymore. She wanted quality, but there's no quality anymore. There's just no time to be, or even talk about destiny. The crystal slipping from her hand shatters back to dust and sand. She needs some frequency.
Move. Give it everything you don't think you got. Come on. Hi, right, welcome back. Uh, I'm right here with the Side Chick Syndicate. Chris on vocals. Yep. Uh, Rick is on guitar. Yep. Uh, we have Brian on bass keyboards, and Haley on drums. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yep. Tell me a little about your guys' origin story. Sure. You know? um, so, yeah. I was in another uh, another band. Uh, Brian came on board towards the end of that band as a keyboard player, um, and then once that dissolved as bands do um, we decided we didn't want to stop doing what we were doing so we started up uh, the side chick syndicate brian came with the name and uh mostly the just the name started as a uh, kind of a kind of a joke as to a lot of things that were going on around us at the time and the things that we were seeing and you know we've experienced and every one of us has probably had one or been one or had something that takes you away from your focus you know anything that you've got on the side can be a side chick you know so it's almost more metaphorical it's in a sense yeah yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely and and love is something that's got two sides it's just like any coin does so it's got its good side it's got its bad side we just like to shine a light on the bad side sometimes and wow. you know, that's kind of where it comes from interesting interesting and so Brian, you're you do a lot of the writing of and kind of the mixing. Tell me a little of that process. Yeah, so um, you know, my influences come from groups like Daft Punk, Chromio, um, the high energy groups, and I've always wanted to have that electronic vibe to it. So it's been fun to experiment. Um, you know, the to tailor fit music to a lyric is difficult because we're always trying to find what mood are we trying to portray sonically. And so we we've, we've gone through so many different versions of songs in the past where I say we I, I, put something out there for us to rehearse and we say, yeah, it's just not working. We're not really try projecting the exact um, feeling we're trying to have our audience get out of it. And so it's, it's a lot of uh, trial and error. I mean, what I like about music, it's the opportunity to create. It doesn't have to be right every single time. Um, it's good to have co colleagues we can work with say, you know, I like it, I don't. Think of this, think of that. We work with each other. We bounce ideas off each other. So um, the biggest thing for me is just trying to find the right timbre or color you're trying to get out of the emotion when it comes to words. And is there a, a, a website to look you guys up, a social media to find you guys? Yeah, we're so. available on Facebook, um, Instagram. Okay. Uh, currently building our website as sure. we speak. It should be available in the next couple of weeks. But okay. uh, we're available on YouTube. We have some uh, promo videos and other fun things to find on there. Is there a place where we can see you guys next? Where, where would that be at? Absolutely. Champion Sports Bar in Biddeford, December 4th, 8 p.m. We're going to be opening up for Signal to Noise. Uh, so that promises to be a really, really good time. We'd love to see as many people out there as we can. The Champions, December 4th, 8 p.m., Biddeford. Uh, and that's our show. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you later. Take care. She wants to take down the love I wear as my crown. She wants me on the ground. She's looking for me. Burning down the city tonight. Burning down the city. Burning down the city tonight. Burning down the city. She's looking for me. Burning down the city tonight. Burning down the city.